the committee will come to order. The committee is meeting today to receive testimony on the evolving nature of terrorism nine years after the 9-11 attack. September 11, 2001 was a day that changed America. 3,000 innocent people lost their lives in the most horrific attack on American soil. The attack was perpetrated by Al-Qaeda, a group of that most Americans at the time did not know existed. On those early days that followed the shock and pain of the attack, we as Americans came together in an unprecedented fashion and made vows to our country, our neighbors, and the victims of this heinous attack. We vowed that we would remain resilient. We vowed to do what it takes to prevent an attack of this magnitude from happening again. We recommitted ourselves to respecting religious freedom. Nine years later, we've honored some of those vows with high regard. We honored our vow to be resilient. A great example came this past May when the people of Manhattan illustrated great vigilance and strength by preventing a terrorist attack in Times Square and then, in short order, getting back to work. We've honored our vow to take steps to help prevent an attack of this magnitude from happening again by reorganizing much of the federal homeland security and intelligence bureaucracy. We created the Department of Homeland Security. We established the Director of National Intelligence and reformed the intelligence community. I'm not by any means saying that those endeavors were a complete success, but there but they were done in the spirit of honoring that vow. Regrettably, one vow that some have shamefully and very publicly broken over the past few weeks is our vow to maintain respect for religious freedom. Just as we must stand vigilant against the threat of terrorism, so too must we stay vigilant against those who would seek to sow hate and divide us along religious or ethnic lines. I'm reminded of the words of then President Bush just six days after the 9-11 attacks, who standing before religious leaders at the Islamic Center of Washington stated, the face of terror is not the true face of Islam. Those words were echoed this past weekend by President Obama at an event commemorating the ninth anniversary of the attacks when he said, as Americans, we are not at war with Islam. Reports of Americans being harmed just because they practice Islam are not only shameful, but distract from the real threats of this nation. Al-Qaeda has to strike in a divided America. Propaganda is the lifeblood of Al-Qaeda. They need outrageous conduct and statements of sort that we have seen in recent days to fuel their recruitment efforts. Importantly, the assessment produced by our witnesses challenges the lies that some have tried to spread about the people of certain ethnicities of religion being terrorists. It reveals that the face of homegrown terrorism is a diverse one. In 2009 alone, they report that 21% were Caucasian, 9% were black, and 4% were Hispanic. The report also finds that homegrown terrorists were just as likely to be educated and prosperous as illiterate and poor. Another noteworthy observation is that in the nine years since 9-11, Al-Qaeda and its affiliate have been able to infiltrate our culture. In fact, the assessment find that more and more of their leaders and followers are Americans and that an embryonic terrorist recruitment radicalization and operational infrastructure has taken root within our borders. Al-Qaeda has been able to do so by using one of America's strengths, the melting pot of values, ideas, and backgrounds to their advantage. The fruits of this effort have been the radicalization of recruits who know American culture because they have lived it. The magnitude of the homegrown threat must be given due consideration at all levels. One question for our witnesses and for our nation is what can we do to counter this insidious terrorist threat? 
Hopefully, our witnesses can give us some answers to this growing problem. One thing for sure, stereotyping and fear-mongering are certainly not the answers. Thank you again for being here. I now recognize a ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. King, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. And I regret the fact that I will have to be uh, leaving the meeting after my opening statement. Uh, there's a series of meetings this morning on the 9-11 health care bill, which I have to uh, be present at with the mayor of New York and others. But I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. And I believe that this is a particularly significant uh, uh, aspect of Homeland Security to be brought up today. Uh, there's no doubt that Al-Qaeda has morphed. The threat of Islamic terrorism has uh, uh, adjusted. It's changed. We've scored great successes over the last nine years. But in uh, uh, response to that, Al-Qaeda has also adjusted itself. While I doubt that a, another 9-11 attack would be possible, uh, certainly very unlikely, the fact is we've seen a number of other attacks which have either worked or come close to working. and it, is primarily, I see, and I agree with the general thrust of your report, that Al-Qaeda is using people living within this country, uh, using people under the radar screen, people such as uh, uh, Zazi, who was a, uh, uh, raised in the United States, went to schools in New York City, uh, who was going to take part in the uh, uh, subway bombing at 9-11 last year. Uh, we also find with uh, Shazad, who actually had become an American citizen, who carried out the uh, almost successful attack in Times Square. These were two individuals who were under the radar screen. Perhaps uh, they, sh they should have been found, but the reality is it would be very, very difficult to, to locate them, especially uh, uh, Zazi, who my understanding is we only learned about him because his name came up in the uh, uh, electronic surveillance of two other people who were carrying on a conversation. So uh, it shows how we have to be so alert to this new threat within our society. And here's where I believe I at least have a, a nuanced difference with the chairman in that I believe more should be done by the Muslim community in this country to be cooperating with law enforcement. Uh, I know from speaking to law enforcement at various levels, they do not feel they receive enough cooperation from the leadership of the Muslim communities. I know, for instance, uh, of uh, Venus, who was a uh, 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 terrorist who was captured in Afghanistan, who actually came from the district adjoining mine on Long Island. Uh, prior to going to Afghanistan to fight, he had gone to a number of mosques on Long Island said he wanted to take part in jihad. He was told by those mosques they didn't do jihad, but they never made any attempt to contact the police or the FBI regarding that. I use that as an example. Also, uh, uh, while the report notes that the, uh, uh, the homegrown terrorists come from a variety of races and ethnic groups, the fact is they were all Muslim, and that's the reality. I think we make a mistake when we somehow don't truly identify the enemy, and the reality is the overwhelming Majority of Muslims are outstanding people, great Americans, but I think we don't do either uh, the Muslim community or ourselves any justice by ignoring the reality that this is an Islamist threat. And uh, to me, it, it makes much more sense to focus on that rather than try to be politically correct. Also, I don't think we should be exaggerating the number of, we talk about anti-Islamic incidents in this country. Every one of them is terrible. Every one of them is wrong and should be denounced. But even in the worst years, there's still five to ten times more anti-Semitic incidents in this country than there are anti-Muslims. So I think we can end up giving it more credit than it deserves or giving more no uh, notoriety than it deserves, including the whole debate over the mosque in Lower Manhattan. Uh, the fact is there are real issues to be discussed there. No one denies the right of the mosque to be there. But I think in an open society, people have the right to discuss what's appropriate and what's not, what's sensitive and what's insensitive. And I think sensitivity is a, uh, it, it, it goes both ways, and it shouldn't just be going in in the one direction. I think if we can have a more open debate and a free debate, I believe we can do much more toward resolving these issues. Having said that, I uh, want to thank the chairman for the hearing. I want to thank the witnesses for being here. I really regret uh, not being able to stay. Uh, we have some hearings that are good, some hearings you know, we have to sit through. This is one I would love to be at from beginning, Dan, because I can assure you that I'd be uh, learning a lot more from you than you would from me. And chairman, I want to thank you for having it. And I understand that uh, uh, Congressman Longman is going to be filling in for me, and he will be more than adequate to the task, and uh, that I know. And with that, I, uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Uh, we do appreciate your participation. We understand uh, that you do have to go, and we understand the reason why. Uh, but you do have an able uh, filler in. <laughs> I welcome our distinguished witnesses uh, uh, of this bipartisan uh, committed today. 
the bipartisan policy center national preparedness group, uh, Mr. Peter Bergen, Dr. Bruce Hartman, and Dr. Stephen Flynn. Uh, Mr. Bergen is a senior fellow at the New America Foundation, where he co-directs the Counterterrorism Strategy Initiative. Mr. Bergen also serves as a research fellow at New York University's Center on Law and Security and as National Security Analyst for CNN. Born in Minneapolis and raised in London, Mr. Bergen has the distinction of producing Osama bin Laden's first TV interview in 1997 for CNN. Professor Bruce Hoffman has been studying terrorism and insurgency for more than 30 years. He is currently a tenured professor in the Security Studies Program at Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service, Washington, D.C. Among Dr. Hoffman's many distinctions is his role as a founding director of the Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Stephen Flynn is the president of the Center for National Policy. Prior to being selected as president of the center, Dr. Flynn spent a decade as senior fellow for the National Security Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. A 1982 graduate of the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, Dr. Flynn served in the Coast Guard on active duty for 20 years. Thank you for your service. Without objection, the witness's full statement will be inserted in the record. I now ask the witnesses to summarize their statements. Since there are three witnesses testifying jointly, I've conferred in advance with the other ranking member and the witnesses and the approach will be taken is to allot Dr. Hoffman and Mr. Bergen six minutes each and allot Dr. Flynn the remaining three. Uh, but I can assure you that if you go over, uh, there's no penalty. Uh, uh, I thank the witnesses uh, uh, and we'll start with Mr. Bergen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman Thompson. Thank you to the committee for the invitation. It's really a privilege to testify here. Um, there is some, I think there is some good news uh, before moving to the bad news. Uh, you know, I completely agree with uh, Representative King uh, that uh, the likelihood of a 9-11 from Al-Qaeda is, is vanishingly small. The last time Al-Qaeda tried to mount such an operation was in the summer of 2006 when they had a plan to bring down seven American, Canadian, British airliners over the Atlantic, but the plot was interrupted by excellent cooperation between the British, American, and Pakistani services, uh, and uh, really a good news. And that's, that's the last time we've seen Al-Qaeda attempt to reach uh, to such a large mass casualty type attack. The other piece of good news is if you look at the, ter the terrorism cases in the United States since 9-11, there are by we cooperated with Maxwell School at Syracuse, and we looked at the 172 jihadist terrorist cases in the United States since 9-11. None of them involve chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear weapons. And Al-Qaeda's uh, experiments in this area have been either amateur or feckless or both. A third piece of good news is since 9-11, only 14 Americans have died in jihadist terrorist attacks. Of course, every, every death was a tragedy. Uh, but I don't think that would have been predictable in the years after 9-11. If we'd had this conversation in 2003, I don't think we would have said, well, almost a decade after 9-11, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda or people inspired by its ideas would only be able to, to kill such a relatively small number of Americans. And the fourth part of good news is, is of course, the Muslim American community has as a, you know, overwhelmingly eject, rejected the Al-Qaeda ideological virus, uh, but there are some changes in that area which I will move to next. Uh, um, one, one, one point, of course, Al-Qaeda does retain residual capacity. If Zazi had got through, dozens of people would have died in Manhattan. If, uh, if uh, the Nigerian Omar Farouk Abdulmulab had succeeded on Christmas Day, hundreds of Americans would have died. But that's sort of the limit of their capacity right now. Uh, I think one worrisome trend is the, what, what we term in the report the Americanization of the leadership of some of these groups. I mean, uh, Shukru Juma, who uh, grew up in Brooklyn and Florida, uh, is now, it looks like he's the Al Qaeda's uh, leader of external operations. Omar Hamami, a, a Baptist convert in, from Alabama, is playing a leadership role in Al-Shabaab. Um, David Headley played an absolutely instrumental role in scoping the targets in Mumbai in 2008, a native, uh, a Chicago resident. 
And of course, there's Al, Al Alauki, which I don't need to get into much more detail since he's so well known. Um, another worrisome trend is we're seeing more terrorism cases, more jihadist terrorism cases uh, in 2009 than we had seen previously. Uh, by our count, 43. Uh, we've had 20 this year. Uh, I'm sure uh, Dr. Hoffman will amplify this point, but we've seen a diversification of the kinds of groups that are recruiting uh, American citizens or residents and also uh, a, a diversification of the kinds of Americans who are joining. As Chairman Thompson pointed out, they don't fit any ethnic profile. The cases that we looked at in the last two years, uh, you can't really say there's any ethnic profile. There is a disproportionate number of Somali Americans because there's been a lot of Somali American cases in the recent, in the recent, uh, in the last couple of years. Um, in terms of targets and tactics, these groups will, will they'll continue. Commercial aviation remains a total preoccupation. Smaller scale attacks, uh, we'll see more of those. Uh, Western brand name businesses around uh, the Muslim world, particularly hotels, have been a constant target of these groups. Uh, 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 recent examples, the Ritz-Carlton and Marriott attacks in, in Jakarta in 2009. I think the possibility of American suicide attackers cannot be dismissed. We've seen American citizens conduct, conduct suicide attacks overseas, and we know from the British experience that once that happens overseas, they can come home. Attacks on U.S. military targets here, of course, uh, if you're fired up by these ideas, uh, uh, soldiers fighting in two Muslim countries are a target. Whether it's the Major Nadal Hassan case, the Fort Dix case, the allegations against the North Carolina cluster regarding the Quantico uh, plot uh, and other cases. Uh, assassinations of people who are perceived to have insulted Islam, I think, is something we should be seriously concerned about. Uh, we've had two American citizens engage in allegedly plans to, to kill a Danish and or Swedish cartoonists who painted uh, cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad deemed to be offensive um, just in the last couple of years. Um, I think a very serious concern that we should all be collectively worried about is the possibility of a Mumbai 2 attack. This would change every strategic calculation in the region. I think the Indians uh, show great restraint, restraint after the last Mumbai attack, but their populations are going to demand some kind of retribution if, if a large-scale attack happens on Indian soil by a Pakistani militant group, which I think is one of the more foreseeable foreign policy challenges we have going forward. Um, then just quickly, uh, some factors that are working for al-Qaeda and against al-Qaeda. Uh, Al-Qaeda has infected other groups in South Asia with its ideas. Pakistani Taliban sent, uh, as you know, a, a, a bomber to Times Square. Lashkar al Taiba is acting in a more Al-Qaeda-like manner. Al-Qaeda's regional affiliates are showing some are weak. Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb is a weaker. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is stronger. Al-Qaeda in Iraq is predictably back uh, in, in a way uh, that, that was, uh, a lot of people were pronouncing its obituary, I think, prematurely. Osama bin Laden, Ayman al-Zawari are still out there. In fact, Ayman al-Zawari just today released a new video tape, uh, audio tape, indicating that he's uh, still alive, trying to influence things. Uh, and finally, our overreactions can play into the terrorist group's hands. So they, they understand e that even near misses, uh, uh, as, as the Christmas Day incident, uh, can produce a, a very um, aggressive reaction, both in the media and, and, and politically. And just a final thought, there are five items working against these groups. The drone attacks are interfering with them to some degree. Pakistani government, military, and public have turned against these groups to a large degree. That hostility is, writ is also true in the Muslim world writ large. C certain key bin Laden allies have turned against him, uh, people that he looked for uh, for religious advice or former, former military allies. Uh, these groups have killed a lot of Muslim civilians, which is a huge Achilles heel for them. And this is a good way of introducing Dr. Hoffman because even though there is declining support for these groups. Declining public support it doesn't help them, but at the end of the day, these are small groups of people, and um, they, can they can continue to operate with little public support. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hoffman. Thank you, Chairman Thompson, members of the committee for the opportunity to present the findings of the report prepared for the National Security Preparedness Group titled Assessing the Terrorist Threat that I wrote with Peter Bergen with the invaluable assistance of uh, Stephen Flynn. Before I begin, uh, let me say that I might disagree with the ranking member and indeed with my dear and old friend Peter Bergen. If I were sitting in this chair on September 10, 2001, I would have testified that it was very unlikely Al-Qaeda had the capability to attack the United States. And if I had been sitting in this chair exactly a year ago, 
September 2009, I would have told you that I'm sure a group like Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula similarly lacked the capability to attack the United States. So if 34 years of studying terrorism has taught me anything, is if not a, a state of pessimism, but it's uh, the words of uh, that great patriot and our hero, Thomas Jefferson, that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. But let me tell you why I think the situation is, is, is one that is cause for concern. Last year was a watershed in terrorist attacks and plots in the United States, with a record total of 11 jihadi attacks, jihadi-inspired plots, or efforts by Americans to travel overseas to obtain terrorist training. They included two actual attacks at Fort Hood, Texas, which claimed the lives of 13 people, and the shooting of two U.S. military recruiters in Little Rock, Arkansas. Five serious but disrupted plots, and four incidents involving groups of Americans conspiring to travel abroad to receive terrorist training. As Peter said, according to our count, in 2009, at least 43 American citizens or residents aligned with Sunni militant groups or their ideology were charged or convicted of terrorist crimes in the United States or elsewhere, the highest number in any year since 9-11. So far in 2010, 20 have been similarly charged or convicted. The conventional wisdom has long been that America was immune to the heady currents of radicalization affecting both immigrant and indigenous Muslim communities elsewhere in the West. That has now been shattered by the succession of cases that have recently come to light of terrorist radicalization and recruitment occurring in the United States. And while it must be emphasized that the number of U.S. citizens and residents affected or influenced in this manner remains extremely small, at the same time, the sustained and growing number of individuals heeding these calls is nonetheless alarming. Given this list of incidents involving homegrown radicals, lone wolves, and trained terrorist recruits, the U.S. is arguably now little different from Europe in terms of having a domestic terrorist problem involving immigrant and indigenous Muslims as well as converts to Islam. The diversity of these latest foot soldiers in the wars of terrorism being waged against the United States underscores how much the terrorist threat has changed since September 11th, 2001. In the past year alone, the United States has seen affluent suburban Americans and the progeny of hardworking immigrants gravitate to terrorism. Persons of color and Caucasians have done so. Women along with men, good students and well-educated individuals, and high school dropouts and jailbirds. Persons born in the United States or variously in Afghanistan, Egypt, Pakistan, and Somalia. Teenage boys pumped up with testosterone and middle-aged divorcees. The only common denominator appears to be a newfound hatred for their native or adopted country, a degree of dangerous malleability, and a religious fervor justifying or legitimizing violence that impels these very impressionable and perhaps easily influenced individuals towards potentially lethal acts of violence. Al-Qaeda and its Pakistani, Somali, and Yemeni allies arguably have been able now to accomplish the unthinkable, establishing at least an embryonic terrorist recruitment, radicalization, and operational infrastructure in the United States with effects both at home and abroad. And by working through its local allies, the group has now allowed them to co-opt American citizens in the broader Al-Qaeda battlefield. It is fundamentally troubling, given this collection of new threats and new adversaries directing tar directly targeting America, that there remains no federal government agency or department specifically charged with identifying radicalization and interdicting the recruitment of U.S. citizens or residents for terrorism. As one senior intelligence analyst who we spoke with told us, Quote, there's no lead agency or person. There are First Amendment issues we're cognizant of. It's not a crime to radicalize only when it turns to violence. There are groups of people looking at different aspects of counter-radicalization, but it has to be integrated across agencies, across levels of government, public-private cooperation, close quote, which unfortunately we found it is not. America is thus vulnerable to a threat that is not only diversifying, but arguably intensifying. Our long-held belief that homegrown terrorism couldn't happen here has thus created a situation where, to, where we are today stumbling blindly through the legal, operational, and organizational minefield of countering terrorist radicalization and recruitment occurring in the United States. Moreover, rather than answers, we now have a long list of pressing questions on this emerging threat, on our response, 
and on the capacity of the national security architecture we currently have in place to meet it. In short, the threat that the United States is facing is different than it was nine years ago. It has also changed and evolved since the 9-11 Commission presented its report six long years ago. Today, America faces a dynamic threat that is diversified to a broad array of attacks, from shootings to car bombs, to simultaneous suicide attacks, to attempted in-flight bombings of passenger aircraft. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Flynn. Thank you, Chairman Thompson. I am uh, honored to be uh, before here today, and I believe my job is to highlight the implications of this assessment for the mission of this com committee, that is the Homeland Security mission. I think there are three key findings that are quite sobering and important for that mission. The first is that the frequency of less sophisticated terrorist attacks on U.S. homeland is likely to grow. The second is these kinds of attacks are extremely difficult to prevent. And the third, this, train, this trend reflects a change in Al-Qaeda's tactics that arises from their conviction that any terrorist attack on U.S. soil, even a near miss, will generate a disproportionate political response that will contribute to their strategic objective, which is to sap the economic strength of the United States. In short, Al-Qaeda and its affiliates are shifting to a war of attrition, rather than concentrating their limited capabilities on organizing, executing catastrophic attacks on the scale of what was carried out on September 11th. What that really means, though, is that fundamentally our strategy needs to adapt in a way that it has not. Succinctly stated, our overarching effort since September 11th has largely been an away game to take the battle overseas, to rely on our national security and intelligence community assets to try to deal with the terrorist threat beyond our shores. So, as President, former President Bush and Vice President Cheney often said, so we wouldn't have to fight them here. Well, as this document makes clear, they're here. And when we're talking about less sophisticated attacks, they're not the ones that basically have the level of tripwires that our tools of national security intelligence have been geared to catch. So what this almost certainly means is that we will be seeing successful attacks on U.S. soil in the near to medium term. Good news, as Peter highlighted at the outset, is they're not likely to be of this catastrophic scale that we saw on September 11th, but the fact is we will increasingly see acts of terror on U.S. soil. Now, what that really highlights is the fact that the new front lines are the streets of Bridgeport, Denver, Minneapolis, and other big and small communities across America. And it's the local cops on the beat and increasingly the American public at large who must be better informed and empowered to deal with this terrorism threat. But this committee is very well aware that we still have a lot of issues with sharing information at the local level. And we also have not done what we should have been doing since 9-11 to engage the American public. Uh, very soberingly, when we looked at the May 2010 bombing attempt in Times Square, it was the sidewalk t-shirt vendor, not the NYPD patrolman, literally at the opposite street corner on 42nd and Broadway that spotted the act and its making. And we saw, of course, on the Christmas Day bombing, it was the passengers aboard the airline that actually wrestled the terrorists to, uh, the, the, the ended up deflecting that attempt. Succinctly stated, the changing nature of this threat makes it critical that the federal government better engage local public safety agencies and everyday people. The other key point I'd like to highlight for us is that since these acts of terror cannot always be prevented, and because they're being motivated in no small part by a judgment by al-Qaeda and its affiliates that we will react or overreact in ways that are beneficial for them, it highlights the need for resilience as a part of our strategy going forward. That is, we as a society must be better able to withstand and rapidly recover from attacks, not as an act of defeatism, but as a way in which we as citizens can provide a preventative quality to acts of terror by essentially taking away the motivation for this kind of attack. So let me conclude with a couple of recommendations to that regard. One is I think we need a more frank acknowledgement by leaders of both sides of the aisle saying to the American people the reality. Terrorism is here to stay, and it's something that we cannot always prevent. And we need you, American people's help in dealing with this going forward. Secondly, we have to be extremely careful of not allowing acts of terror when they happen 
to essentially take advantage of our 24-hour news cycle and the almost certain overwrought media coverage that comes with that to essentially fan a sense of anxiety without a whole lot of information flowing from it. This is going to take a commitment by political leaders, again, of both parties to studiously avoid making public comment, which might elevate public anxiety in the aftermath of terrorist attacks until we get the facts straight, so we're not feeding and fueling the very threat. So in closing, let me uh, cite, I think, which is a key finding of this assessment. Nine years after September 11th attacks on New York and Washington, the changing nature of the terrorist threat makes clear we must be willing to re-examine many of our counterterrorism assumptions and approaches. Only then can we succeed at maintaining the upper hand in the face of an adversary who continues to demonstrate the ability to learn and adapt. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I thank the witnesses for their testimony. I remind each member that he or she will have five minutes to question the panel. I now recognize myself for questions. Uh, again, let me thank uh, uh, two of you gentlemen for the report, but also Dr. Flynn for your response. Uh, one of the issues, uh, as you know, we are grappling with uh, is this notion that somehow radicalization occurs here in the U.S. Uh, is more a threat uh, to the homeland than previous threats on individuals trying to come. Now, from your report, it appears that uh, there's no one size that fit all kind of, of uh, uh, potential terrorist. What can you offer this committee uh, as to how we should put uh, something in place uh, to address the emerging uh, uh, homegrown terrorists? Uh, one of the things is the intelligence gathering matrix that's kind of a uh, hodgepodge of groups. Um, uh, your comments talked about we don't have uh, uh, a specific entity to address it. And uh, while we've been fortunate, uh, it's still catching up after the fact uh, with those agencies. Uh, if you see the intelligence gathering as a problem in this, I'd like for you to comment uh, on this also. Uh, Mr. Bergen, if you want to. Uh, Chairman Thompson, I, I think that I would just offer two things that we shouldn't do. Uh, one of the conclusions of the report is that there's no real ethnic profile here, so profiling is not a particularly helpful approach. Another thing I think we have to be quite careful of, learning from the British experience, if the only, if you securitize the, re the relationship with the Muslim community, so it's basically a police function entirely, uh, the Muslim community may well, you know, not be very happy about that and see that as sort of an intelligence gathering exercise. Um, so we have to be, as, as, as you pointed out, there doesn't seem to be any entity that's really responsible for this. Obviously, local police are, do have some, some role to play, but it can't just be local police. The relationship with the Muslim community can't be just a law enforcement relationship. And wh who that person or who, who that entity should be, I'm not really sure. Is that DHS? Uh, that's something I think that is up for discussion. Well, I think w one of the issues, Dr. Hoffman, if you would, is so many times it's the state and local entity that confronts the homegrown issue before the federal entity. And to some degree, uh, there has to be a relationship, and we're not certain how that, that operates, but a homegrown situation probably will develop and get identified uh, with state and local uh, officials, probably in a better sense than a federal, but the perception is that terrorism is a federal issue. Mm -hmm. And so somehow we need to connect the dots. And if you could kind of help the committee with that. Well, uh, sir, as you, as you well know, your efforts uh, to, to enact the uh, LEAP measures the law enforcement assistance program would have been an invaluable step forward in this process. I think the report reveals two important dimensions. One, 
we're not necessarily saying that the federal government is asleep at the switch on this issue, and we're not arguing that nothing is being done in this respect. I think our main criticism, or the main, the main finding we perhaps identified is that it's not as coordinated as it should be, and there doesn't seem to be any one agency or entity taking the lead on this and fashioning a strategy that would reach out to the community, and that, as you just described, would also empower state and local law enforcement. The second point that we illuminate in this study is that the threat is becoming more diverse, and unfortunately we see it as one that's growing, at least over the past two years. It's beyond the capability of the federal authority to know, you know every plot everywhere in the United States. I think logic dictates that we have to better train and educate law, local and state law enforcement to be part of this process. Now again, I think in snatches and snippets, this is being done. And this is an important priority that's recognized, but I don't think it's received the sy systemic and systematic attention that it requires as part of an overall strategy. And that the bits and pieces that I think do represent great progress over the past nine years, our argument would be that they're stillborn. There needs to be greater coordination and indeed greater recognition of the role of state and local authorities and jurisdiction. Dr. Flynn. I would just really like to reinforce Dr. Hoffman's recommendation. We really have to get the training and education pushed down to local law enforcement. It's a much more serious and concerted effort, and it's going to be high quality training. Uh, the second piece, though, I think is very important, and it's the least sexiest problem, but it's probably one of the most important, and that is the tendency to overclassify information, making it very difficult to get it to where it needs to go. And so what we have when we have uh, information at the very highest level under very strict rules of, uh, of secrecy, it makes it almost impossible to get to the people on the front lines. And we really, the, the UK has made a very concerted effort from the top down saying the threat warrants us getting more information out. We need to look with far more ear on the side of sh sharing information than on controlling information. It's a big change from the Cold War mindset where we kept it all close to the chest to one where we need to go today. Thank you. That, uh, yeah, the overclassification has come up in a number of instances, as, as you know. Uh, I now yield five minutes to the ranking member, Mr. Okay. Uh, the next to the ranking member, Mr. Smith. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd also thank Mr. Uh, Lundgren for yielding as well. Uh, Dr. Hoffman, I have a couple of questions for you. The first is, uh, according to your report, uh, you suggest that another attack on the level of 9-11 is not likely. But I'd like to ask you whether you think attacks on a lesser of a scale are more likely or less likely. Well, certainly the pattern of the plots that we've unmasked over the past several years suggests that um, lower level attacks, but nonetheless highly consequential ones that would claim lives, perhaps not on the magnitude of the right. thousands. That's my question. Are they more likely or less likely? More likely, sir. Okay, thank you. That's not happy news, but that's what I suspected. Uh, and that goes to my next question. This is a quote from you, I believe, in the report. Uh, it is troubling that there remains no federal government agency or department specifically charged with identifying radicalization and interdicting recruitment of U.S. citizens or residents for terrorism. Um, we clearly should have done that, uh, particularly considering the threat that you just mentioned of sort of the lower level, uh, but nevertheless uh, uh, traumatic and terrifying type of attack. Um, what agency should have been responsible for taking that initiative? Should it have been the Department of Homeland Security or another agency? I don't know the answer to that. I think one of the problems is that each of these agencies that has a counterterrorism mission brings both strengths and weaknesses to the table. I think first and foremost there has to be greater coordination and some overall strategy clearly directed from the White House. And rather than creating a new agency or rather than tasking any one agency, it's a question more of coordination. Should, should, speaking of the White House, should the White House have taken the initiative on setting up that kind of a structure? My personal opinion and indeed testimony that I've offered before the, the subcommittee yes. in this room, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question is this. The 9-11 Commission recommended a biometric entry exit system. That was also in a 1996 bill that I introduced and that uh, was enacted into law. Um, how important do you think that type of a system is to trying to either deter terrorists from entering or being able to determine whether terrorists might have overstayed uh, and still uh, reside in this country? 
Well, I, I, I'm not familiar with the legislation. I think, though, it, what we have seen, though, unfortunately in recent years, is an increasing traffic of individuals from the United States seeking to go abroad to receive terrorist training and then returning to the United States. So, at least from your brief description, I think something like that would contribute to the identification and the mo monitoring and interdiction of right. those individuals. Uh, that's something else I think the administration should be taking an initiative on, just as you suggested in the other area as well. And I hope that we don't sustain any kind of a terrorist attack, even on a lesser level than the 9-11 attack. And as you just suggested, the administration uh, should have been doing a lot more than it has been, and I agree with that. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, I recognize the young lady from California for five minutes, Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, we have before us the trifecta uh, if I have to think of uh, three white guys to talk to about terrorism, this is my list, and I talk to all of them regularly. Uh, as you know, Mr. Chairman, and as they know, uh, this uh, committee, Subcommittee on Intelligence and Risk Assessment and Information Sharing has held a number of hearings where they have testified <coughs> on the topics that uh, they are speaking to today, uh, and I agree with virtually everything all of them said, even if there were some internal inconsistencies, um, about the threat uh, against us and how it has changed and uh, how it may be um, um, less catastrophic, but I, I think it is more likely and it is much more difficult to detect and stop. So let me just uh, uh, focus on a couple of things that I think um, uh, might be um, useful to tease out from, from this uh, group. Uh, one is um, uh, this uh, House uh, passed something a few years ago called the Home Violent Radicalization and Homegrown T Terrorism Act um, uh, by an overwhelming vote. Um, some groups, outside groups, decided that for reasons that I believed were misguided, uh, that bill was uh, 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 not going to be helpful. I just wonder if any of you would make comments about that bill. I know that uh, Dr. Hoffman in, in particular uh, is very familiar with it. Let me just put my questions out and then you can use my time to answer them. Uh, the second is um, you agree that uh, 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 terror groups are less likely to carry out an attack on the scale of 9-11 um, uh, but but and more likely to deploy a crude weapon to cause panic and severe economic disaster. I just wonder uh, what you think of the likelihood of a dirty bomb attack, especially one using, for example, uh, ingredients that can be found in uh, radiology machines in our um, domestic hospitals, uh, something that concerns me. So that's my second question. And um, the third question is, um, you've said that we can't, stereotype who the attacker will be. I agree. Um, Jihad Jain, uh, as we all know, uh, not named after me, I don't believe, uh, was a petite, blue-eyed, blonde, suburban housewife. Uh, do you, uh, what should Congress do to get a better handle on this? Well, Representative Harmon, uh, as you know, at least uh, twice sitting in, at this table, I've not only endorsed but lamented the fact that H.R. 1955 was not enacted into law in 2007. I think, as I've said before, we missed an ideal opportunity at the time to get out in front of this issue instead of, as we've been throughout, I think, most of the war on terrorism, playing catch up and reacting to the terrorists. So the, uh, I think we need it now more than ever. Uh, we need a solid empirical foundation to understand how people are radicalized, how they are recruited. We need to understand much better how other countries are responding to this. So we firstly don't reinvent the wheel, but secondly don't repeat their mistakes. Uh, and I think a bipartisan national commission like that would provide that foundation. And I think it would directly feed into the type of coordination and strategy that, that we need as well. Uh, secondly, the dirty bomb question. There's two perspectives on it. As you know, and you've had Rita Katz from the Site Intelligence Group testify before, that this, this uh, non-governmental entity monitors uh, jihadi chat, chat sites, web rooms, communications, and so on. Interestingly, what they've found over the past few years in their own research is that 
terrorist interest in these unconventional weapons is actually rather small, that the vast majority of chatter, talk, plans, plotting, daydreams, and so on, is consumed with more traditional forms of attack, the weapons, weaponry the terrorists have mastered, uh, guns and bombs. However, that's not to say that there aren't discussions of these issues. Interestingly, dirty bombs don't figure very prominently, so at least that's the you know, statistical, empirical evidence that they've found. But I think your point is well taken, because what we have seen in the years since 9-11, in London, for example, was one plot in 2004 involving an individual named Diron Barot, where, uh, who actually also plotted to attack targets in the United States in 2004, simultaneous attacks in New York, New Jersey, and Washington, D.C. Uh, but meanwhile, he was also cooking up terrorist attacks in London, and they were twofold. One involved packing limousines with uh, homemade explosives, much as we saw, saw in Times Square last May, enhanced with uh, fuel air explosives, and he said that's what would kill lots of people. He also was planning to stage a dirty bomb attack, and he said that probably wouldn't kill lots of people. But the appeal for him, and presumably his terrorist masters, is that that kind of unconventional attack would cause widespread panic and fear and have disproportionate mm -hmm. and highly insidious and corrosive psychological I hope to, uh, I regret interrupting you, but my time has expired. Mr. Chairman, could the other two witnesses answer my questions briefly? Would that be permissible? Uh, will the gentleman answer the question? Uh, on the radiological discussion of chem, nuke, and bio, as Dr. Hoffman indicated, is actually very, very low on uh, jihadi websites. Uh, on the other hand, a radiological bomb, because the materials are fairly ubiquitous and the know-how is not that complicated, I think is something we should be concerned about. Um, so any measure that we can take, I know that you have uh, some proposals in that area, uh, Representative Harmon, uh, would be very useful. I, I think I'd reinforce the fact that with two overarching trends, we're moving to less sophisticated attacks. So the ones we're really scared about, a nuclear weapon, for instance, much more difficult, and one which our national security apparatus is more focused on doing the bigger consequential ones. So the, therefore, that creates incentive to move to less sophisticated attacks and one that you have domestic materials here to accomplish that attack. So uh, the trends are pulling us in this direction, even though we don't have all the empirical evidence that we have jihadists really working on this. But I would really put it like in, in, when it happens, and it could likely happen, is it becomes a lot like what just happened in the Gulf of Mexico. People are going to be just, well, where were the plans to respond and recover from those events? And that's where we're woefully inadequate here. And our efforts being so geared to trying to prevent every bad thing from happening, we really haven't thought through the morning after problem. And that's where I think you'll find the American public outraged at basically how little prepared local uh, level law enforcement, public safety is to deal with this, and information, quality information, getting out about how to deal with that. So it's a big issue. It may be low probability, but it's such high consequence, it'd be getting much more attention than it's been received. Thank you very much. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chair now, yes, the gentleman from California, Mr. Lundgren. Thank you very much, minutes. Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the three panelists. This is most interesting, and we could spend hours uh, going over the nuances of your report and your opinions. One thing I want to make, uh, make sure we have clear on the record, even though you're talking about the shift of Al-Qaeda and their associates to a lower consequential uh, uh, type of attacks, there's no suggestion on your part that we um, stand down or um, uh, even reduce our concern about the consequential attacks, correct? All right. So. I want to make that clear, that we've got to maintain that. The question is, do we also have in eternal vigilance with respect to the lower consequence attacks that appear to be more likely and becoming more likely all the time because of the um, change in tactics by those who would uh, do us such harm? Uh, I, I come from a background in part from local and state law enforcement, and one of the things that always intrigues me is uh, the much larger number of law enforcement personnel on the state and local level than you have on the federal level. And that in um, investigating certain um, organized crimes or gang activity, uh, it was often a lead that we got at the local level for an investigation that had nothing to do with what we ultimately came up with. That is, uh, I remember we took down a, a major um, 
auto accident fraud based on investigation by a CHP officer of an automobile accident. And then that led us to um, uh, dealing with uh, counterfeit uh, products. Um, if the officers involved had not been alert to what was out there and had then not had the ability to talk with officers engaged in other types of investigations, we never would have taken down those separate organizations. So it's nothing really new in terms of the adaptability of the officer at the local level. The question is, do we establish the encouragement and the means by which that cooperation and collaboration can take place? From your standpoint, um, what more do we need to do, at least from the federal level, to ensure that that occurs in the area of the terrorist threat? I would ask that to all of you. I guess I'll take the first stab at it, sir. I think you're absolutely right. Part of the recognition that I think this report really highlights for us is that we've been relying on a very federal and largely national security oriented effort since 9-11 to deal with the threat beyond our shores. And again, that's where the most consequential threat is likely to emanate from. And our good efforts over there in part has helped to reduce that risk, but then drive the strategy in this direction. What I have not yet seen is a shift in research and focus that says the local, the state, the com increasingly communities are where we're going to find the intelligence we need and often the first prevention effort is gonna to have to be mustered. Well, for instance, I, I just uh, visited uh, in the last couple of weeks the Fusion Center in Sacramento, which, which allows an opportunity for all levels of uh, law enforcement to come together, share information, and in fact gain confidence with one another so that when they see something that may have an indication that could lead to an investigation of terror, they act on that. Um, obviously, we can always do more, but it seems to me fusion centers, the cooperation, and the establishment of an experience level so that there is confidence that an officer on the federal level from one of the agencies can pick up the phone and talk to someone at the local level. So they, they, they've gained a confidence in the um, in the abilities of one another and trustworthiness of one another. Yeah. Uh, I, I think they're absolutely vital, sir. I mean, cops talk to cops. They don't talk to bureaucracies very well, and for good reason. Uh, so you create those opportunities with fusion centers. One of the challenges, though, clearly many localities have is simply funding the officers to be a part of those fusion yes. centers. And there, again, they're serving a national security imperative, and I think finding more level of support for communities to participate in those fusion centers is probably the logical next step, given let, the budget crisis that are facing. Let me just ask another problem. question about something that uh, the gentlelady from California and I have worked on in the past, and that is the radicalization of our prisoners in the area of uh, potential recruits for terrorist lone, uh, lone wolf or organizations. Uh, any comments on that? Are we doing what we need to do? Um, and, well, first of all, do you think it's a problem? And secondly, are we doing what we need to do? Just to unify the two questions you had, I mean, and it's something that Representative Harmon is very familiar with because it happened, I think, in her district. I mean, Torrance, California was a very serious plot that was found by the local police who just paid attention to the fact that the documents in these guys' possession, uh, they were knocking off gas stations, were uh, indication of a potential attacks on synagogues and, and U.S. military recruiting stations. And uh, these guys had all got radicalized in prison. Uh, they were uh, African Americans. They they saw themselves as Al Qaeda in California. Um, so this is a real problem. I, I don't know if it's a, you know, really massive problem, but it's certainly a problem. Uh, we've seen plenty of people convert uh, to Islam in prison. Ninety-nine percent of them, it's not a problem. But for what, for one percent, it may it may well become. Thank you. Chair, uh, now I recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Uh, for five minutes, Mr. Carney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the panel. Uh, again, it's great to see all of you uh, back. Uh, I, I just have a, a, a three questions. Do we, do we need something like an MI5 in this country, first of all? I mean, I'll jump in on that here. I, I don't find it workable. The size of the country, and one of its great strengths is that because of our distinct regions and cultures, frankly, part of our country, 
that a top-down kind of centralized uh, organization that could work on a scale of the UK I don't think is workable here. I'd like to see us just be much more forward-leaning and tapping the local capabilities we have and, and making sure they get the information they need and that they have a voice, at least uh, regionally, beyond their own jurisdictions to uh, uh, continue to work these challenges. Well, how do we become proactive rather than reactive? I think fundamentally it really is a case of getting information out to folks about what the threat is. We've not done that as well. This is why this hearing is so important, and we hope the report is helping here, that the threat is different than one where we could just rely on our uniform men and women and our intelligence apparatus to take care of us. We are now much more having to engage as a people in our local law enforcement. We have to make sure the resource to do that. Uh, and the information about how terrorist attacks work uh, you know, I've made a pitch of, we've had five airline incidences where the passengers have been, it turns out the folks, this is not two in the U.S., but uh, overseas. We should have in court at our airports the, how these bombs are made. What do the behaviors look like? Get the flying public engaged is part of this. We've got to get the information pushed down, in other words. That's the only way you're going to get proactive. You're not going to do it by relying on the pros behind the, essentially, cone of silence. I think that's the direction we need to go. And it's more than just policing. It's really a broader engagement of the American society. Dr. Hoffman? I would agree with my colleague that uh, we don't need an MI5. I think we, this is the kind of debate that might have been more useful some years ago, but uh, given the reorganization of the intelligence community and the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, I think probably the last thing we need is another bureaucrat bureau bureaucratic organization added. What I would say, though, is that I think one reason that the Central Intelligence Agency has o always functioned uh, as effectively as it has is because there is uh, the synergy between the Directorate of Intelligence and the National Clandestine Service that used to be the Directorate of Operations, at least from my observation. This remains a problem with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, that the intelligence analysts there are still a very separate cadre. They're a cadre that is not uh, equated with any sort of status or certainly the prioritization that often attends special agents. And that's where I think the major strides and improvement have to be made in strengthening that dimension of the FBI alongside the excellent special agents. Okay. But you would agree, Mr. Bergen? I, I agree. Okay. Um, I, I'll ask, I suppose, a bit of an existential question here. How do we demotivate them? I, I think one that I would highlight again is what has motivated in part the movement towards less sophisticated attacks is the confidence they have that as a country, we will overreact when things happen. That is, they'll get, generate significant political fallout, and they'll get a almost spasmatic response, probably by this body, to th put band-aids very quickly, and they'll be very costly and disruptive. It follows, it seems to me, that the more resilient we are, and that means we acknowledge the threat is real, but we take measures to be able to better deal with it. There's a crisis communications element that so rob them of the benefit they're expecting to get, is not, that won't eliminate the threat, but it will start to demotivate it. This is very much a strategy in Israel. It's very much a strategy in the UK. It's we're not going to give them the bang for the buck that they're aspiring for. We need to show as a country that we will not be cowed by acts of terror. And we do that by being well prepared and not losing our heads when these things happen. Dr. Hoffman? Or, or, you know, I, I, I would just make a sort of historical observation, which is I think 30 years ago, Jihad Jain uh, potentially would have joined the Weather Underground or something. And I think for a certain group of people, if you want to act out against the United States, give your life some sort of meaning, this is just a convenient way to do it. Um, and, um, you know, so it's not how do you demotivate them. There are always going to be people looking for a cause that gives them importance. And for, for some people, this is the cause. I mean, God is telling me what to do. I'm an important person. Uh, you know, I think that's part of the motivation. How you take that away, I think, is very difficult. But I think Dr. Flynn is correct. If you're not going to get the glory, you know, if, if, it's, if it's sort of a dud uh, when you try and do these things, uh, I think that takes away some of the excitement here. I'll add that one of the trends that we uh, identified in the report is that increasingly the recruitment radicalization processes are becoming more effective amongst our enemies. They have individuals like Anwar al Awlaki, who was born in the United States, who can communicate extremely effectively in a very familiar patois with Americans. Um, people like Omar Hamami from Mobile, Alabama, who's gone and joined Al Shabaab. And Rather than just you know, the default being, let's just go out and kill them, we have to find a better way, a more effective way of countering their message. Again, I would go back, this is why we needed a 
legislation such as Congresswoman Harmon had proposed three years ago to understand how to do that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. One of the comments here is that, um, uh, Dr. Flynn, you said terrorism is here to stay. I think part of it is how do we as Americans incorporate that in our way of life so that we can go about our day-to-day -day activities, but you still have to understand that the threat is real. And I think that is, it's either the fear of the unknown or something that, that I think causes Congress and others to overreact when situations occur, just like the Christmas Day event, uh, we bought a thousand new machines to go in some airports, not all airports. And the question is, was that uh, the way to do it or did we need to incorporate that situation into the matrix of terrorism and try to address it in a different manner? Uh, so that it's not a knee-jerk response to a situation. And I think that is the, the, what I feel so often is that the discomfort with discussing terrorism is we're not sure how to address it. Sir, can I make an observation? Um, you, you can't have these discussions, political leaders like yourselves have to have these discussions with the American people before the event and not after the event. And here is what the speech I think should say. I think it's politically hard to say, but this is that all these things are true. Al Qaeda is not 10 feet tall. By the law of averages, Al Qaeda and its allies will get one through eventually. And we are doing a lot to protect you. But I think that is a kind of complicated political message to, even though all those things are true, I think it's hard, but you can't, if, you can't have that speech after the event. You have, to, you have to prepare the American public before. And it goes to what Dr. Flynn is talking about, resilience. We have to prepare the society to be more resilient. It, right now, it's very brittle. Near misses are producing this enormously hysterical overreaction. Imagine what, ha what, ha what would happen if 253 had blown up yeah. over Detroit. I, I guess I really want to just follow, the, I think that's exactly right what Peter said, but the follow through is, and we need your help. And I think that's the message we failed to say after 9-11 and nine years later we still not have actually done. We haven't gone out to the American people and said we need your help. At its core, fear works when first I become aware of a threat of vulnerability, but then when I feel powerless to deal with that threat of vulnerability. Well, you so know. The more we empower people the, the, and inform them, the better I think we chip away at fear. Yes, well, and I think this is where uh, we're trying to go with it because the department and others are talking uh, a simple thing, see something say something, and that hopefully will add to, to, to bringing everyone into the system of helping fighting this terrorist, potential terrorist threat that exists. Uh, in the past, we have left it to state and locals and the feds, and where the majority of the eyes and ears just kind of go about their daily business. But I think to some degree, we will have to get the public involved in this. And, and that, because we can't buy enough equipment, we can't uh, do that to, and then it, then it still won't guarantee that something won't happen. I, I guess what I'm trying to say, but, but for politicians, that's difficult to say because we want to, the impression that, you know, we are guaranteeing with this appropriation that whatever this situation is won't happen. So, Mr. Chairman, but, if I could just mention one thing, and I think it goes on with what the uh, three panelists are saying, we have to tell the American people that much of what we've done and we've asked for from them in terms of tax dollars has been successful. The only way you can engage people is if you recognize when they, what they have done has helped. You've all talked about how we've made the likelihood of the, the more consequential act less likely precisely because of what we've done, done. We need to explain that to the American people so when we ask them for other things, including being involved, they understand that what they've done thus far has been helpful. 
And I don't think we do enough of that to acknowledge the successes. And as you say, talk about the fact that Al Qaeda has been damaged, is less likely to be able to have those consequential attacks precisely because of what we've done. That doesn't mean we don't do other things. But if you're going to ask people to do something more, you've got to give them credit for what they've mm -hmm. done already, mm -hmm. I would think. Gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Dent, for five minutes. Oh, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for uh, uh, presenting to us today. Um, there's been a lot of talk about al-Qaeda and how that threat has evolved and how it's diversified. Uh, we didn't talk so much, though, about other terrorist groups. Uh, President Harmon and I just came back from Afghanistan. You hear a lot about the Pakistan Taliban, the Haqqani Network, uh, LAT, uh, al-Shabaab uh, in, in Somalia. How much of a threat do those groups represent to us in this country? For example, we knew that there have been reports of the Pakistani Taliban being involved with the uh, uh, Times Square attempt. Uh, but these other groups, particularly, uh, I'm interested particularly in uh, Al Haqqani and others. What, what is your sense of these other groups uh, internationalizing their, uh, their efforts, similar to Al Qaeda? Um, thank you, sir. The, I mean, the Pakistani Taliban, a, a real canary in the mine, which people didn't look at, was the fact that the Pakistani Taliban sent suicide bombers to Barcelona in January of 08, which should have demonstrated that these guys were willing to do attacks in the West. And uh, Spanish prosecutors uh, say the Pakistani Taliban were behind it. The Pakistani Taliban have admitted their role. But luckily, the attack didn't succeed. So Times Square was not an aberration. It was part of a pattern. So I, you know, I think that the Times Square incident speaks for itself. The Akhani network I don't really know. I mean, they seem very focused on Afghanistan. They don't seem to be interested in, in out-of-area operations. But you mentioned Shabab. Shabab is a try to kill the Danish cartoonist uh, responsible for the Prophet Muhammad cartoon, uh, almost succeeded. Um, they, all, they did an attack in Uganda that killed 70 people. They've shown some ability to do out-of-area operations. Um, I think it would be naive to think that they aren't, you know, they've identi self-identified as an Al-Qaeda affiliate. I think they're potentially problematic. And la finally, lashkar e Tiber, I think, is really probably the more important of all these because it's the largest group, it attracts educated people. Have, you know, the attack in Mumbai demonstrated that they were willing to hunt down Americans and Jews in the Nariman House and that they've adopted Al-Qaeda's ideology. Um, and so I think that is, that is quite worrisome. If I, I may want to add, I think an important finding is to the extent that these groups diversify geographically, and now we have a trend of Americans going overseas to get training, this is much more challenging for our intelligence community to keep on top of. It's just the sheer geographic expanse and the nature of ethnic communities and travel associated with that makes it mean that that connection between domestically motivated terrorists uh, on the U.S. side can connect more with the training infrastructure that's now getting more sprawling. And uh, can I just quickly ask, because I have a, one more question after this, uh, do you see that the al-Qaeda threat, at least operationally, seems to have uh, moved more to the Arabian Peninsula than the uh, Afghanistan-Pakistan region? Do you see that as the being the real al-Qaeda uh, operation center now? Uh, you know, I, I, I think not. I mean, there's a lot of focus because of the Christmas Day incident, but I think, you know, Al-Qaeda Central is still on the Af Afghan-Pakistan border. This is where the ideology is. The training continues. The drones have taken some uh, impact on them, but uh, I think to sort of say, just because we've seen a lot of activity from Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, as a story in the Washington Post said, that now that's the biggest problem. I, th I, I just don't see that. I would say that Al-Qaeda is, is as opportunistic as it is instrumental and where it sees a potential to spread and to expand, it takes advantage of those opportunities wherever they may, 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 appear, may appear. And for them, I think the advantage is it used to be that if terrorists wanted to join Al-Qaeda or an Al-Qaeda-like group, they had to go to either Afghanistan until 2001 or in recent years to Pakistan. Now they have closer options from the United States to travel to Somalia or to the Yemen as well, perhaps other countries. You know, can I have just quickly uh, pivot to one other issue. You know, uh, I think we all saw, you know, we witnessed a move uh, last week that was uh, probably every bit as reckless as it was stupid when this uh, Florida pastor, uh, you know, was publicly weighing his options to burn the Quran to make some kind of statement. Um, at some point, uh, someone really is, is, is likely to do something uh, this stupid and put it on YouTube uh, and then, or, or some other social networking site uh, is there any way, is there any way that uh, uh, we as a, as a, as a public uh, can inform the international community uh, that while our, our laws don't uh, prevent such uh, 
serious acts, uh, uh, you know, they are, they are being conducted by, you know, kind of a loony fringe element. Uh, is there anything that we can do uh, to help educate people abroad about uh, how our country operates when these, when these situations arise? Uh, I, I think it's not well understood uh, in a lot of countries. I mean, we've seen riots in Afghanistan after the Quran burning was canceled uh, that killed people. Um, and since these are countries that aren't often free, uh, they don't really understand the First Amendment. And I mean, we can say whatever we want, uh, just as, as, as the gentleman has said, we could make those points, but I don't necessarily think they're completely well understood uh, in some countries, unfortunately. I, I would just add that it, there really is a leadership element of this. If, if it's clear that our top political leaders are saying what President Bush said just a few days after 9-11, as Chairman Thompson quoted at the outset, that terrorism is not the face of Islam, then that is an important message, I think, in terms of when these acts happen. If we continue to uh, potentially uh, have that issue get mixed, then people will point to those aberrant events as indications of a broader uh, um, concern we have as a society with Islam itself, and that feeds the narrative. It's a very complicated issue, obviously, but I think more care needs to be happening at the leadership levels of our government as well as care what we want our citizens to exercise, too. In this case, it seemed like virtually every leader stood up and you know, basically objected, and, and uh, unfortunately, he didn't carry it out. Again, in advance is the key, right? Yeah. I think that's the thing. Yeah. We've got to keep at it in advance uh, of it. Otherwise, uh, the, the image itself will carry the day. None. Well, I, I would just say I think we have to, in general, be more effective in our overseas communications than we already are. For example, the voice of Amer over 90 percent of the Voice of America's efforts are directed towards traditional media, print or radio or television, which appeals only to a certain demographic, whereas a lot of these messages of hatred and intolerance mobilizing people in the streets are communicated over the Internet, yet less than 10 percent of the Voice of America's activities are, 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 are directed at that medium, which has become so powerful. Yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, now I recognize the gentleman from Texas for five minutes, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witnesses for appearing this morning. And I am uh, interested in several things, and I'll try to focus on two, possibly three. One is relationship. We've had some discussion this morning about relationship. And uh, if relationships are important with the Muslim community, and they are, then the question becomes, how do you perfect not just a relationship, but a meaningful relationship with the Muslim community? How do you perfect that relationship? Uh, it requires more than simply showing up when there's a need to investigate a circumstance. You have to show up when the masjid or mosque is being dedicated. You have to show up when there is a special event taking place and be a part of the event. My experience has been that we don't do enough to extend ourselves to the community so as to let the community know that we want a meaningful relationship. And I'm curious as to whether or not there is some sort of how-to uh, manual, if, the, if you will, that helps persons to understand how to build a meaningful relationship across cultural lines. Do we have that kind of intelligence that we can, we can simply pass out to people in some meaningful way? I, I want to endorse everything you said, sir. I mean, I think that's incredibly important. How to perfect that relationship, I think, is a very big question that, I mean, I, I don't think we're all capable of answering right now. But I, I'd like to make a comment, which I think it is, is illustrative of the strength of the Muslim American community in this regard. The fact that these kids from North Virginia who went, wanted to volunteer for the Taliban were turned in by their own family I think speaks for itself. And in some of the Somali cases in, in around the country, the same thing has happened. It's the family that's raised, raised the red flag. And so wh whatever our relationship is with the wider Muslim community, the Muslim community itself is the best tripwire for the kinds of things that we identify in this report. And we've seen that uh, on several occasions where it's what really worked. 
I would say that we need the equivalent, the American equivalent of the Quilliam Foundation, which exists in the United Kingdom, which enlists individuals who themselves have been radicalized and who themselves have been drawn into these movements to communicate with other young people and to communicate with communities and explain the processes and procedures and the blandishments and the entreaties that recruiters use and how to resist them more effectively. I would just add one thing, and I think this is something that the New York uh, Police Department has fairly been exemplary on. One is you work very, uh, very early on and very actively to draw and recruit your members of those communities as part of your law enforcement community. There are more foreign-speaking police officers in the NYPD, the entire federal government apparatus combined, mm. because they make an effort to reach mm. out to the communities to engage them to be a part of that community. The other very central piece is you don't go to those communities for the first time when you're policing and say, we need your help fighting terrorism. You go to those communities and say, we need, what do you have for problems in your neighborhoods? And you provide services for that. If it's car thefts, if it's uh, kids getting beat up on the way to school, you engage communities by providing them services and make them feel that they're integrated and a part of that community, again, with the kinds of things you're saying up front. So uh, we, there are ways to do this. We've done it. We just need to now magnify that effort, I think, in light of the threat that we've been talking about here today. Let me thank you and compliment the uh, NYPD, because you've moved to my, my next point about uh, recruitment. But there's a third point, language. Language is exceedingly important. Emily Dickinson, I believe, uh, gave us this. A word is dead when it is said, some say, I say it just begins to live that day. We have to be careful with the language so as not to want a relationship, but show up with language that indicates we don't understand the, the, the people that we're trying to work with. And if we're not careful with this broad brush language that we use on the national stage, we find ourselves creating, putting a chasm between ourselves and people who really want to work with us, but the language creates an invisible barrier that makes it very difficult for them to step over and uh, receive the hand of friendship that we desire to extend. I think that language has to be dealt with such that we pass that, that down, up and down, vertical, as well as horizontally among uh, leadership in this country. And finally, Mr. Chairman, I thank you. I'm nine seconds over. I, I just want to end with this. Uh, you, we talked about how people show up and they want to investigate. I'll give you a supreme, superb example of something that happened in my presence. I was not the person speaking, but I w was privy to the conversation. An investigator came into the African-American community many, many years ago. Uh, when we were having our civil rights movement. And his question to us was, have you seen anything strange happening today? And the uh, young man who was among the group said, the only thing I've seen strange is a white man in this community asking me if I've seen anything strange. So my point is, we, we have to be sensitive to, to the people and have a relationship beforehand so as to be effective after a circumstance has developed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the instruction <laughs> for the gentleman from <laughs> Texas. Now, recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleveland, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bergen, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, for all three of you, for the work you're doing. Uh, what struck me uh, in your testimony, you talked uh, uh, about jihadists. You talked about the 21% the, uh, uh, Caucasian, 18 percent um, uh, Arab American, 14 South Asian, uh, 9 percent African American, uh, and of course uh, that concerns me. Uh, and, and so I'm wondering if there is a common thread that runs through the the, the groups that you mentioned uh, that you believe led to their commitment to uh, becoming a, a jihadist. Uh, is there some some characteristic? Is there something unique about uh, about them? I mean, uh, are they high school dropouts? Are they, uh, you know, individuals who have been arrested once? I mean, is there anything? Uh, the short answer is no. I mean, Major Nadal Hassan was earning ninety thousand dollars a year. He was a medical doctor. He was, you know, a senior army officer. Um, Najibullah Zazi was a limo driver at Denver Airport, uh, an Afghan-American. I mean, there's, there's nothing 
there's no profile ethnically, socially, and there's no, there's nothing you can really say. I'm, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Hoffman, but there's nothing you can really say that this is a common theme of all these people. Um, you know, Jihad Jane, who was a high school dropout with some failed mar marriages, uh, you know, wasn't living, la living large, uh, but, you know, Nadal Hassan had everything going for him in his life, at least theoretically. So there isn't really a, 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 some common themes there. Dr. Hoffman. I would say nor should we be surprised that that's the case. The British found this, the exact same thing after in their investigations following the 2005 suicide attacks on London. The conclusion of the House of Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee is that there is no profile of, of the British ex Muslim extremist either. And indeed, over there, the diversity that Mr. Bergen has just described exists just as well. People from South Asia and North Africa, from the Middle East and from the Caribbean, young and old, single, married, converts, lifelong Muslims, university graduates, and high school dropouts. And Dr. The, the only thing I would just add is that when we talk to some of those senior intelligence and national security officials about this issue, the fact that we cannot, in fact, have this uh, very clear profile of what these folks are makes these acts almost impossible to prevent up front. That's just the reality we're having to deal with. So with, at the federal level, again, relying on those tools, it's this other themes that we've been talking about here today, engagement of community, local law enforcement, public safety, those become key with dealing with this because the other tools are just not going to work for us. Thank you. Uh, my s second and final question uh, has to do uh, to, to, to deal to do with uh, uh, the fact that you um, have said in your testimony, at least Dr. Bergen did, uh, that Al Qaeda is focused on symbolic targets, um, and which is why they hit the, the World Trade Center. I, I'm, I'm from the Midwest. I used to be the mayor of a midwestern city, Kansas City, Missouri. Um, and I've often thought if I were a, a terrorist, I would absolutely avoid New York, Chicago, San Francisco, uh, Los Angeles, uh, and go to the Midwest because we have pretty much declared the Midwest to be a place where there could be no symbolic uh, success or a target that would, would create the kind of uh, oomph that, that, that Al-Qaeda apparently wants to, to uh, produce. But Kansas City is, is one of the large rail uh, centers uh, in the country. Um, and I don't know if there's anything symbolic in a transcontinental trade, uh, you know, disrupting it w w that would attract Al Qaeda. But more than that, I just, um, I mean, are they so focused on symbolism that they would uh, forego uh, something that would be infinitely easier and less dangerous. Um, yes, I mean, that's a very good question. Why don't they attack in any, anywheresville, USA, in some mall? It's one of the questions we address in the report. And Al-Qaeda and allied groups, uh, you know, the people they're trying to impress and influence have never heard of Des Moines or of Kansas City. <gasps> I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> they've heard of New York, LA, DC, blowing up an American passenger jet, and they keep returning to these targets again and again and again. You know, Najibul Azazi drove from Denver, Colorado to Manhattan. He was living in Denver to do the attack. So that is not to discount. We've seen some of the failed plots that Dr. Hoffman referred to. Springfield, Illinois was a target of a, of a plot last year. So it's not to say that people inspired by Al-Qaeda's ideas might not try an attack in Kansas City. But the Al-Qaeda organization, I don't think so. Yeah, I, I, um, this, he, he was not Al-Qaeda, but... Uh, Keep in mind that the Murr Federal Building uh, was attacked in Oklahoma City, uh, which is, is, is smaller than Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, I, uh, Timothy McVeigh, of course, it, it was, was not affiliated with Al-Qaeda, Al and, and, and so maybe he wasn't that concerned about symbolism. But. Yeah, but Mr. Cleaver, I'd say I've been to Kansas City, and I will look at your rail issue out there, and I remain deeply concerned. Again, one thing we need to take is a more strategic perspective in this as well. 9-11 illustrated for any future adversary of the United States that the soft underbelly of this country is its critical infrastructure. And while the current group of folks that we looked at in this report don't show indications of that, we can't proceed, I think, as a nation within the illusion that we are not gonna have folks who identify places where we could get profound economic disruption to our way of life, uh, critical nodes like uh, in your 
your, your backyard? I would say that one of the main conclusions of the report is that we face a diverse threat on multiple levels from multiple adversaries as well. And as the map on page two of the report indicates, that in the United States there have been two extremely serious plots in the past year or two directed against New York City, which is worrisome enough because I think it calls into question our ability to deter our adversaries if they keep going back to the hardest target. But as the map shows, there were successful attacks tragically in Fort Hood and in Little Rock, Arkansas. There were serious plots, as Mr. Bergen described, in Springfield, in Dallas, in Detroit, and elsewhere. So I think one of the challenges we face as a nation is to understand that perhaps for a certain category of our adversaries, a place like New York will always be un, you know, undeniably attractive. At the same time, though, given the multiplicity and the diversity of the adversaries, they will strike, as, as I earlier said, where they see the opportunity and where they see that the effects can be the most profound and the greatest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Chair, now I recognize the gentleman uh, from Florida for five minutes, Mr. Bill Rockus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it very much. Uh, and I apologize for being late. I was in a Veterans Committee meeting, uh, actually a markup. Uh, first question to the entire panel. I've long been concerned that our visa issuance and oversight processes, particularly uh, the student visa, is uh, inac inadequate. In fact, I've introduced legislation that will help ensure that terrorists do not use our student visa process as a backdoor into our country. We know the terrorists involved in both 1993 and the 2001 World Trade Center attacks were in the U U.S. because they violated the terms of their student visas. Do you believe the question, do you believe that terrorists are still able to explore our student uh, visa system to gain entry into the United States to radicalize American citizens and or engage in uh, terrorist attacks for the entire panel? This is really a comment rather than a complete answer to your question. I, in the 2009 Manchester plot in the United Kingdom, uh, the people involved all were on student visas which they overstayed. So certainly this is an idea that is percolating with uh, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, because these guys were all from that area. Um, I mean, on the, the counter argument would be, we want to encourage people from Muslim countries to come to this country to study, and it's already pretty difficult for, for them to get in. We don't want to penalize, you know, the 99% of the people who are coming legitimately. Uh, already, you know, getting a visa in a country like Pakistan is pretty problematic, uh, student or otherwise. And so we have to balance those two things uh, because there are two different goods uh, at, at stake here. I, I would reinforce what Peter's point in the last regard is certainly a more effective system, but it would have to be very well resourced for it to work more nimbly than it does. What we're doing uh, overseas with consular officials is putting lots of requirements on without much capacity, creating backlogs and challenges that keep the legitimate good people we want in process. So. So we have to really think about when we lay that requirement, how do we make sure we adequately manage it? We should be doing it very competently. But uh, the deep concern is that uh, at the end of the day, our most powerful tool has been for the overwhelming, uh, 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 I think, success of the American experience is having people experience it uh, to get here and be at conferences and schools in our classroom. The overwhelming majority then go back home and bring those values with them. If we basically uh, start to, to, to uh, close that down, it's all so difficult, given the media that's out there, for people to validate the greatness of this country if they haven't experienced it. So it's, it's a real difficult tension, I think, that's at work uh, here. At the end of the day, the, the threat does continue to, to uh, I think the key is not overselling what these tools can do. The diversification will happen. The recruitment is going to populations that are within our own uh, society, so we, we have to, I think, see it through that a more encompassing lens. Well, it's a very pertinent question, particularly given the profile in the New Yorker uh, this, this week of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who first, the mastermind behind the 9-11 attacks, who first came to the United States as a student. Uh, one of the cases we identified last year, of course, involved a student, although not a student in the United States, Umar Farouk Abdul Mutalab. It has been, as Mr. Bergen said, uh, more common, and I think the British authorities see it as a, as a very serious problem in the United Kingdom. My point would be that, unfortunately, over the years, trends in terrorism that we've seen elsewhere inevitably come to the United States, even if they haven't manifested themselves in any significant way here yet. But the case of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, of course, is an indicator that people who come to the United States draw their own conclusions as well from their student experiences. Thank you. Uh 
Next question uh, for the entire panel again. Uh, terrorist organizations have become adept at using the Internet to recruit, inspire, and motivate individuals in the United States to carry out attacks on their behalf. What are your thoughts on how to combat the use of Internet and other technologies by terrorist organizations that seek to inspire and encourage terrorist attacks in our country by those who are already here? You know, I think there's a huge First Amendment problem and there's a huge technology problem, which neither of which I think are very superable. Um, the technology is always going to be better than what the government can do. Um, and so trying to close these kinds of things down, of course, there's the intelligence gathering that you can gather from these Internet sites, which is useful. Um, I, you know, while it might be desirable to try and do something about this, I think it, in practice it would be very hard. I've, I've testified in this room before, Congresswoman Harmon's subcommittee on this, on this issue, and I think it's one of the biggest problems we face in, in the sense that the Internet has become this vast vacuum that unfortunately the purveyors and communicators of hatred and intoler intolerance have taken advantage of, not least, I think, to peddle often base, completely untruthful conspiracy theories that gain incredible traction. I see this as a problem that we've talked about, in essence, for nine years since 9-11, but there really hasn't emerged any strategy or any approach to how to deal with it. Under Undersecretary Glassman and the previous administration, I think there was progress being made in the State Department on this because he was someone who understood that you have to knit together the various communications arm of the United States. But I think that was sort of a, a, brief, uh, a brief flurry of activity and prioritization that unfortunately has fallen by the wayside. The other thing I'd add is I, I think it's clear that we need the counter messages, and we talked to, uh, uh, Dr. Hoffman mentioned it earlier here, that this AID and, uh, and the uh, focus uh, on our public communications abroad is primarily still traditional media, and we had to get to different media. But one message that I try to convey again in my domestic audience as well overseas is this is a resilient country, and we will not be cowed by those who want to threaten us. We bounce back better and stronger when hit. And, and try, but we will bounce back better and stronger. We have to have messages that don't feed the sense that this, these acts of terror will give these folks great glory and, uh, and opportunity. So basically, resilience is important. It, absolutely. That, one of the challenges, I guess, Mr. Chairman, with that concept, I think, before was, it was a sense that that would be an element of defeatism by saying that we have to be resilient. That means you're not working hard enough to prevent these things in the first place. Nonsense. When we uh, communicate our resilience, we're, we're having a deterrent effect. It's a part of our strategy of prevention, letting people know that this is a strong country, a capable country, as it illustrated on 9-11 with the uh, efforts of the folks in United 93, as well as how people respond in Manhattan to get people off. This is a country has lots of stories uh, to tell about our resilience, and we need to do a better job communicating them, I think. I agree. A gentlelady from Nevada, Ms. Titus, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, when you're the last one, often much of what you want to say has been covered, but I'd like to go back to a couple of points uh, as it relates to my district in southern Nevada. You talked about future attacks focusing on distinctive Western uh, trademarks. And I, I heard you mention some major cities. You didn't mention Las Vegas, and Las Vegas is probably as quintessentially American, maybe in good and bad ways, as it comes. And so we often worry that we might be a soft target. I think, too, about trademarks as um, McDonald's and Starbucks, I've often thought that the way to have a really demoralizing effect on the country would be for 10 terrorists to walk into 10 Starbucks around the country at the same time and blow them up. It wouldn't be a lot of people, but it would be in an area that would make us feel most vulnerable because it's everyday life where you don't expect it. A lot of people aren't ever going to go to the World Trade Center, but they're going to send their children to McDonald's or they're going to stop at Starbucks and they just wouldn't expect it to happen there. So I would ask you to comment uh, on that. And also, in Las Vegas, the chairman mentioned he was in the district with me recently to announce our See Something, Say Something effort. I think we need to put more resources behind that because it's very effective, especially if there is no set profile. In Nevada, we are doing training of housekeepers and valet parkers and taxi drivers 
all to say, if you see something, you hear something, you smell something that's out of the ordinary, don't be afraid to report it. And it's been very effective. So more of that kind of programming, I think, would be a good idea. And then just finally, you've said we <clears throat> excuse me, need to change the culture. We need to talk about being resilient. We need leadership that uh, uh, says they oppose uh, uh, activities like burning the Koran. But you haven't really given us something specific that we can do as a legislative fix. What can this committee do or what can Congress do or where should the money be redirected or the resources so that we can do the things that you're talking about? Is there anything specific you can tell us? I'll leave my colleagues, I guess, to talk to, to about the threat. But again, I, I think for the reasons you identified, Las Vegas certainly should fall in the list of one series, series that we should be concerned about. The effort to support the See Something, Say Something campaigns, I mean, the key is that it's useful information that, uh, that's credible information tailored for the communities that it's in, and also that when people report, they have the confidence they're going to get a live voice and, and some response is going to be treated with respect. That's resources that clearly have to be committed to that, uh, that enterprise. So uh, at the pub local public safety agencies need those resources and capacity, I think, to go there. I think one just woefully underfunded effort is built around things like Citizen Corps. And Citizen Corps, where, you know, the, the more probable, the reality is the more probable consequential events in this country are going to be natural disasters. And yet the skill set we need to deal with those disasters are going to very much serve us well in dealing with this terrorist event as well. And so really efforts that move beyond just the terrorism focus, but says all, virtually if you stay put in this country, 95% of Americans are going to get hit by a natural disaster at some point building citizen core kinds of capacity, where you incorporate in that as well the, this is one of the hazards that we face as communities, we need capabilities. Then people, I think, will see a direct return and we start to get the kind of return of the social contract that we want uh, to deal with emergencies going forward. So I think that's an area where we could focus potentially as a, as a body more attention on. Thank you, ma'am. Well, I think one of the problems we face in this country is unlike law enforcement officers in Iraq or Afghanistan or Pakistan or even Israel where terrorism is a daily occurrence. Here, this isn't necessarily something that's front and center on their radar screens. I think except with some signal exceptions, NYPD, Los Angeles Police Department, Chicago, various others, and I would have to include in that Las Vegas PD and the Nevada State Authorities. I've personally conducted many training sessions where I found uh, Las Vegas Police Department members who are also members of the military who serve in reserve intelligence units mm -hmm. and who take very seriously exactly as you described the potential threats to Las Vegas and are doing mostly on their own exactly the right thing, reaching out and seeking to improve and enhance their own education and training. And this goes into your second question as, we, as we've discussed and as uh, the chairman has, uh, has been behind these moves is to bring those same, the NYPD model in essence, uh, Speaking personally, amongst all the meetings that we had with various officials as part of the National Security Preparedness Group, but I'm biased as a native New Yorker, I think one of the most inspiring and informative and certainly cutting edge we heard was from Commissioner Ray Kelly and what NYPD is doing. And it is an acknowledged model, but it's enabling other municipalities and other localities and states to have the same opportunities even though they have, don't have the same budget that New York has to partake in these opportunities with federal assistance. Just on the Starbucks question, I mean, these guys, uh, they're mostly guys, of course. Um, you know, if you look at what their targets have been, New York City subway was Zazi, Times Square was Faisal Shazad, um, you know, Northwest Flight 253 was Omar Farouk. They just keep coming back to the same targets. They're just not going to do Starbucks. I, I appreciate that. It's just interesting that you say they keep coming back to the same targets, and yet you also make the same point that they, they don't do the same thing. They keep looking for gaps in our security to find opportunities to do different things. Isn't that a little contradictory if we're trying to be forward-looking as opposed to replaying the same scenario over and over? I, actually, I, I don't think those things are contradictory. They keep going to the same targets, but they're looking for new gaps. Okay. So, you know, plastic explosives in the underwear, this is a new gap. And that, well, I would raise to the committee a very important thing that I think we mentioned in the report. Whoever built that bomb is still out there. The Yemeni bomb maker who built that bomb, he almost succeeded in killing uh, Prince Mohammed bin Nayef on August 28th of last year with a bomb that is exactly the same one that was used on Northwest, Northwest Flight 253. 
and according to a, a range of officials that we spoke to for the report, this guy, there's no evidence this guy is out of business. And he will try and put a, a, a plastic explosive bomb on a plane somewhere in the world at some point. I, I think what's key is that with this scenario is that we have plans and we think through how we would respond. These are very important companies, parts of our economy, and we should have, have thought through, even though the probability remains, I think, fairly modest. I would only add this. It, it, on its face, it sounds pretty simple to send 10 simultaneous bombs in the Starbucks, but that is actually a lot of effort. Right. And, for, and, and so it, it has an element of sophistication that requires a bigger group, more coordination communication that gives us some ability in the conventional law enforcement as well as intelligence to trip them up. So it's a lone wolf kind of attack that's probably more likely to be probable, and people may not draw the sense that there's a systemic vulnerability. So that's probably where it's in and in between strains. Bottom line, a brand will be devastated by that, so the company should have a vested interest. But we as a government need to have a plan for, again, the morning after problem. When this does happen, how are we going to respond so we don't create an incentive for them to keep coming back to that same problem? If, could I address the, what you, the apparent contradiction? Just very Without quickly. objection. Thank you, sir. Um, one of the salient conclusions of the report is that unlike in the aftermath of September 11, 2001, we don't face any longer one threat from one terrorist group, in essence, in one place, but it's rather a diversity and a multiplicity of threats. And I think at a certain level, the most senior levels of al-Qaeda, they are very much bent on symbolic targets, perhaps fixated on New York. But as the report points out, the threat is diversified and also increased. And as it's multiplied, it's spread throughout the country, and it's also as we discussed a few minutes ago, zeroed in on different locations and different levels of targets. And I think that's the fundamental, char fundamental challenge we face in counterterrorism today is we have to have a far more flexible and a far more dynamic approach than at any other time, certainly that existed in the aftermath of September 11, 2001. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and I just want to take a moment to uh, thank the panel, but as well to acknowledge uh, I believe this committee has important work to do. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for both the series of hearings, but the intensity of the oversight that we've had throughout the history of this committee, and to the ranking member and to Mr. Lundgren, who is sitting uh, in place, I think none of us um, would underestimate the importance of hearings like this or having a committee called Homeland Security, which as all of you witnesses know, we had no such thing prior to 2001. And um, uh, we probably had uh, some clue, but a limited clue. Uh, I co-chair the Pakistan caucus and I, and the Afghan caucus, and I, I, I have watched as I've worked in those entities, um, and particularly the popularity of those countries rise and fall. So I want to say this um, without um, any uh, comment that is disparaging on this committee or the work that we're doing, but I think it's important to say, I don't feel safe. Uh, and I think it's important that we acknowledge this question of the speculation of security and safety. Uh, and as we do that, it makes us more diligent, more faithful, and more responsible to these issues. So I'm going to raise these questions um, on the grounds of not feeling safe. Uh, and uh, Peter, if I might, Mr. Bergen, as we've listened to your commentary, let me not let you don't perceive this as a critic. You are usually somber and straightforward in the message, because I think we should be serious about this. I frankly believe that we are franchising terrorism. I think the report says something about diversification. When you have someone who left uh, Ghana and made their way through into the Netherlands and into the United States, when you have a captain in, in uh, Fort, uh, in Austin, uh, I'm sorry, Killeen, Fort Hood, my state, and having gone to Fort Hood as well, uh, getting information or being inspired uh, negatively by someone in Yemen. I went to Yemen shortly after, and I think my colleague, uh, Congressman Harmon, is one, shortly after the incident in uh, in December. And what the Yemen leadership said is, we want help, but we have thousands of unemployed young men uh, that are fetter, uh, fodder, if you will, for this issue. Would you comment on the franchising of terrorism, which means how do we pinpoint it? 
How does a committee that is fixed in time, that sits in Congress, a department that is fixed and sits in Washington, address the question of the franchising of terrorism, which gives no appointment, no notice, um, other than, of course, the idea of human intelligence, which, of course, is very important. Would you add to that the issue of aviation uh, as a major target, and is it attractive because it's a wow, uh, and is there anything we can do to take away the wow? And the last point is um, this anti-Islamic feeling, movement, trend with the peak of the gentleman from Florida who I never could imagine would exist in this country but did and captured the minds and hearts of the world for like two weeks. Mr. Bergen? A lot to cover, but yeah, I mean, certainly the franchising is a problem and we've seen, but we're, I think it's a problem we are aware of I and mean, the fact that Congressman Harmon and Congressman, Congresswoman Harmon and yourselves have both been to Yemen, I think speaks for the, the fact that, you know, whether it's General Petraeus when he was at CENTCOM and others, I mean, there, there is a focus there. Uh, taking away the wow from aviation, I don't think is going to happen. Taking away the... Taking away the wow. I mean, aviation is the lifeblood of the global economy, and these guys have a narrative. They want to bankrupt us, and, you know, if, if 253 had blown up over Detroit, I mean, we would have taken a huge hit in the middle of the worst recession since the Great Depression. There's no doubt about it. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, that's just going to remain their, their, their key target. Um, as for the anti-Islamic fervor, I mean, this plays directly into the hands of the jihadis, there's no doubt. I mean, they use it constantly as a talking point. Uh, the fact that they can say, well, look at the controversy of in, over the Manhattan Mosque. This is a recruiting tool for them. And the extent to which we, obviously, we ha having an open debate about these issues is the American way. But we should be cognizant of the fact that our enemies are exploiting uh, real anti-Islamic bias or perceived anti-Islamic bias, wh whatever the case. As, a, as one of their talking points. Dr. Hoffman, thank you. I'm sorry. No, I, I don't have anything to add. I think aviation, no matter what we do, will remain a salient target, exactly as Mr. Bergen described, because our adversaries don't see as much defeating us militarily as undermining us economically, and they think that by focusing on commercial aviation that that will be a proven means to throttle our economy and certainly our global commerce. I, I would just add on the aviation piece at least. The, the, the biggest concern, of course, we rightfully had after 9-11 was using an airplane as a guided missile with passengers aboard. And two relatively straightforward things helped to deal with that, hardening the cockpit door and changing the behavior of the passengers on board those planes. And so, yes, aviation will be targeted, but not in the same way we saw after 9-11. I think it's an important perspective to keep in mind. But broadly, I think, is a challenge for this committee is, and I think, again, it's the key thing to be taken away from this analysis. We've been doing something very expensive and working very hard at it, which is to use the conventional national security, national defense apparatus we have to conduct the war against terrorism. What we have not done nearly as uh, well, and with near the sense of priority or investment, is to deal with the homeland security enterprise that 9-11 revealed. At the end of the day, the attack happened here. And yet, we basically invested in taking this to the enemy. What this report makes clear is that that effort of basically trying to keep this threat at arm's length is not something sustainable in the long run. And we have to make investments commensurate with the threat and vulnerability and the need in the homeland security realm. So can I add just one thing about aviation, which I think is important? In 2002, an Al Qaeda affiliate in Mombasa tried to bring down an Israeli uh, charter jet as a service to air missile and almost succeeded. And this is not a chicken little scenario. These guys do have service to air missiles. They do have the intent and they have the capability. And I think that that is, if you could bring down a commercial jet somewhere in the world, it doesn't have to be American. Right. We're in a kind of transformative moment. And I, unfortunately, that is, I think, a predictable kind of attack that they will try and pull off in the future. Mr. Chairman, can I just ask you to yield? I'd like to put something on the record, and I'd like you to hear it, please, because it, it adds to this point. And I won't call the city, and it might be obvious. One of the things that we don't uh, think about as we give federal monies is how local governments receive it and interact with it. Uh, there is an er airport that is receiving AIT equipment, advanced uh, imaging technology. Um, the, imp the, the placing of the equipment was delayed because of local government permitting problems. 
to the extent that the equipment is not in today, uh, and it was supposed to be in almost a month ago. Uh, and so when we think of the work we do here, how we interact with local officials, and of course we've heard a lot of compliments about good works that they've done, and they do, but just a building permit issue that they may think is not significant or they're not focusing on what we're trying to do, which is terrorist hmm. equipment, um, and, and it's standing there waiting in a box, I, I think that's something that maybe we will look at or how we can do our outreach to the local communities and how our work here uh, gets translated in the right way. So I just wanted to put that on the record because even today the equipment is not in. You sure you don't want to identify that city? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's the worst kept secret <laughs> in the hearing. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Jackson Lee. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Chair now yields for a uh, point of personal privilege for Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just failed to acknowledge, and I think we all should, the presence in the audience of Carrie Lamack, uh, whose mother died on 9-11 and who has been one of the most active members of the 9-11 families behind responsible oversight and good legislation in Congress to uh, deal with these threats. Um, I called the, the group that she's part of the wind beneath our wings as we enacted some of the changes after 9-11. And I, I carry, I, I don't know how we would ever do this without you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Flynn, since we have you here, uh, I want to get a, a comment from you. Uh, you've talked a little bit about the diversity of the terrorist threat. Uh, what do you say to those uh, out here who are still balking at uh, this notion of 100% uh, scanning of U.S. Uh, bound cargo? My biggest concern remains that the intermodal transportation system is still vulnerable to potentially, I think it's more in the realm of a dirty bomb as a scenario, that should it get into the system and go off, that all the risk management tools that have been put together to date will be discredited, and the response will be, like we've done offshore right now in the Gulf of Mexico, is a moratorium on the movement of goods so we can sort it out. And the consequence of that would be cataclysmic. And so we need to move beyond the status quo into something that gives us a far better range of confidence when, if this scenario plays itself out, than the tools we have today. I think it is possible when you engage the industry to get to a far higher percentage of scanning that's more toward the 100% end of the spectrum than it is the tiny fraction we do today. But the key is to move beyond the polemic that this everything was fine until this legislation came along and then that that's simply unachievable there's a middle ground here where our overarching effort has to be the resilience of the intermodal transportation system if it's exploited. And I'm very much concerned that we have been stagnant for three years, with no movement in this area, and a consequence could be really quite catastrophic for our economy. Again, per the analysis here, do we have data that tells us this is a near and present? No, but it'll take us a long time to put the system, the right system in place, and there's more that can be done. Well, I, the reason I raised it is uh, we continue as a committee uh, to press the department to follow the congressional mandate uh, rather than to interpret the mandate as they see it. Uh, and we basically say, you don't have a choice uh, in the matter. So I, I guess I'm just looking for an amen that Congress is doing right. Amen. <laughs> thank you very much. I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. Before concluding, I'd like to remind the witnesses that the members of the committee may have additional questions for you, and we will ask you to respond expeditiously in writing to those questions. Uh, hearing no further business, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you.